All right. Let's get started. Okay, you need to work with me today. I'm quite sick. I don't think I'm contagious, so don't worry about that. But I have an ear infection. I thought you only get it at two. So I don't know how this happened. I was at a conference, at my Super Bowl, like, like conferences and so on, uh, for the past four days. And I didn't get enough sleep because like, I had networking and everything. Uh, and I don't know if it's like lack of sleep that caught, caught up to me or something happened. So I'm sorry about my voice. I don't know if you hear me well or not because I don't hear myself. So if I'm too quiet or too loud, please let me know. Also, if you're asking a question, please ask loud. So I cannot hear anything. So it's, uh, it's quite bad. But it's going to be like only an hour and a half. So hopefully we'll have some fun. And then we have a guest speaker at uh, 6, 630. And she's going to talk, talk to us a lot about like technologies for monitoring and a lot of cool stuff. So all right, let's get to it. Uh, I'll start with a quick review, and uh, then we go to complex systems. Um, okay, so low redundancy, low level redundancy, high level redundancy, right? What is low level? What is high level? Low level is redundancy of each component by itself, right? High level is the entire system has a redundant copy. So like low level will be Let's say I have let's say I have A and B. Right? This will be low level because everything has a copy of itself. So there's redundancy at the component level, right? For the system, for sorry, high level, then it will be the entire system. And we analyze these systems quite uh, deeply, right? So we, we figured out that given the same components. Which of the two has a higher reliability, higher low, low? Okay, perfect. So we established that analytically, right, and, we, and numerically. But then we also analyzed it intuitively, right? We looked at path from in to out. Right? How many paths do you see from in to out in the high redundancy system, the bottom system? Only two paths, right? One from the top and one from the bottom, right? What about the top system? You can map four different paths from top to bottom, right? So essentially, because we have more number of paths, it's kind of more reliable, right? Because there are, there, there are so many ways you can get, a, get around the possibly failed system. But it's only the case because I have the exact same components with the exact same reliability. So I can technically design a system where it has the form of the top one, but it's less reliable than the bottom one, right? If the reliability don't matter. But in general, if you're talking about lower redundancy, high redundancy, low is more reliable than high because of the no higher number of paths given the same reliability of the components. Make sense? Okay, any questions? All right. Okay, then we start talking about key out of end systems, right? They said that we typically show them like a parallel system. And we say, okay, so for k out of n system to function, if we have in, out, all of path, uh, we want k, at least k, right? If these are n, we want at least k of them to work, right? So we said that, okay, so all of these components can fail independently. They have the same reliability. I know the exact number of components when I start. So these are all recipe for binomial, right? So we said, if I wanted exactly k, it will be simply binomial with, reliable, with a probability of success r, which is our reliability, right? And then exactly k, so it will be n choose k, reliability to the k, 1 minus reliability to n minus k. But this was when we had exactly k, right? But k out of n systems is at least k. So I'm going to just sum up where I'm allowing this to iterate from k all the way to n. k or k plus 1 or k plus 2 or k plus 3, right, all the way to n. And obviously, if I'm adding too many, too many, um, too many of these terms, sometimes it pays off if I look at the complements, right, because it will be 1 minus like 0 at first, one, second, and so on. So it, it may be quicker. Again, both are exactly the same. The same both are accurate 
correct results, but one is just maybe a little bit faster to, to calculate. Okay, any questions? Good. Okay. All right. So yeah, we can we can analyze a bunch of very uh, fancy looking systems. This we know. This we know, and we we'll, we talked about them last week. But then this there's a big question mark about how to analyze this part. Right? Let's let's zoom in. All right. I have five components, right? A through E. And just looking at it, it's obvious that it's not parallel or series. Am I right? We cannot break it down into parallel or series. So what can we do? First thing, let's let's ask this question. Uh, if all of these components are working, does the system work or not? OK, OK, that's a good start. So let's assume all are working. All components are working. What is the reliability of the system? So it will be, maybe I should ask, in what case you will have all working? You want A to work, and B to work, and C to work, and E, right? And I know that they're independent of each other, right? So I'm going to just multiply them by each other, right? So that will be when everything is working, the problem that everything is working. It would be 0 0.9 times 0 0.9 times 0.95. So let's go to the 2. Oops, I don't have a lot of space. 0.9 to the 2, 0.95 to the 2, times 0.8, right? And this will be... I think 0.58, right? So this will be the case where everything is working. Let's say, let's look at another case. Only B and C not working. Again, can I analyze this case? First, if B and C not working, is the system, is this, uh, does the system work or not work? B and C are failed. The system works, okay. So we can count it. So count it in. OK, so now B and C shouldn't work. So B is failed. What is the priority? 1 minus 0.9. And C is failed. 1 minus 0.95. And A is working, 0.9. And uh, D is working, work, works, 0.95. And E works, 0.8. Right? And if you multiply them together, you're going to get a number. Okay, so what am I doing? I'm doing total enumeration, right? I'm coming up with combinations. I'm saying, okay, what is the probability that this case happened? And then I analyze the path in my head to say that, okay, this is the case the system works, the system doesn't work. Right? So I'm doing total enumeration. So if I'm doing this, how many combinations should I look at? I have five components. Each of them can be working or not working. So how many total combinations am I, am, do I need to consider? Two for this one, two for this one, two for this one, two for this, two for this. Two to the five. Right? I can say, okay, A, uh, so that I assume A, B, C, D, E, right? Works, 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 doesn't work, doesn't work. Or doesn't work, doesn't work, 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 right? Or work, doesn't work, doesn't work, work, doesn't, right? So I can come up with how many combinations? Okay, 32. So let's look at actually two of them. This is total enumeration. I'm looking at each case, I'm mapping, if in this case, this is the one that we analyze, the system works, and this is where B and C don't work, this is another case we analyze, the system works. But for instance, if we were to look at this, we didn't need to calculate it because the system fails, right? This is where A and B work, and, uh, or fail, and the, the other three work. This is the So I'm just... It may look very confusing. I'm just doing total enumeration. Not very smart, but it gets us there. Gets us there. I'm calculating all of the probability of success, right? And then I'm just summing them. Question? No, exactly. I'm forgetting about the system. I'm analyzing in my head. I'm doing this path in my head, right? I'm saying. Give me something where, where A and B don't work and C and D and E work. Does my system work or not? If my system works, then I can associate that probability to system working. And then I can just write all of these cases and add them up. Yeah, so I'm, again, exactly, because I didn't know how to analyze the system. This is too complex for me. So I'm just looking at cases. 
how many total cases do I have? 32 cases because I have five components. Each of them can assume two, case, two, two positions. Does that make sense what we are doing? Okay, we're going to build on that. So let me know if it's unclear. Okay, so again, this is doable, but it's not that smart. And imagine if I had one extra, okay, let's ask this question. If I had one extra component, how many more cases would I need to analyze? Double, right? Th another 32. Because then I can have all of these 32 combinations when the new component fails, and I have all of these new combinations when the new component is working. Right? So I, it, it grows exponentially. So it's too, too many. Right? So OK, so this is one extreme. The one that we were doing where we were understanding the relationship between systems, that's another extreme. Right? Let's see if we can find some middle ground. Right? Take advantage of some of cases, but not quite. So let's see how it works. Let's look at this link network again. OK. So let's focus, what, give us, what, what gives us trouble here? Which component did you wish didn't exist? E, right? So let's remove it. Let's assume that E failed. What am I left with? Perfect, OK. So I'm going to break it down into two cases. Right? I'm going to say E failed. So E doesn't exist here. So I can remove the whole thing, right? I'm going to draw it here. I'm going to have A, C on the top, and then I'm going to have B, D on the bottom. The system is perfect. I can easily analyze it. What is the reliability of this case? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. OK, so far, so good. I just made a small assumption that E is failed, and I can analyze my system. Fair enough? OK. So let's do the opposite. Let's now assume that E is working. Right? I'm removing the, the, the uncertainty from it. Right? I'm assuming E works all the time. So it, it is a little bit more maybe complex to analyze this way. But let's see what it means. How many paths, I'm assuming E works all the time. How many paths do you see from in to out? And what does that system remind you of? So look at it. It works if I have AC. It works if I have BD. It works if I have AD. It works if I have BC. What, is, what does that remind you of? Do you agree that this is the system? You agree that it boils down to this. Do you see that? OK. Makes sense, right? It, in, in the first look, it looks different. But as soon as you start analyzing it, you see, oh, exactly the same number of paths, exactly the same path in these two. Right? OK. So in that case, this is easy to analyze as well. right? Let's call it R of 2. What is the reliability here? I have A, B in parallel. And CD in parallel, and the two super components, whatever I want to call them, are in series, right? So it will be what? Something times something. What is the first something? 1 minus 1 minus RA times 1 minus RB, right? And 1 minus 1 minus R. Exactly. Right? So this is easy to analyze too. All right, so we're not quite done yet. Because we looked at two cases, right? E works, E doesn't work. Exactly. So I'm going to put them back together. I'm going to say R of the system is when E works, right? I have the second one, 
And when E fails, 1 minus RE, I have the first one. Okay, we have a name for what I'm doing here. What is the name? I'm essentially doing something on E. Starts with a C, O, N, T, I. I'm conditioning on E. Right? Right? I'm saying, okay, if E doesn't exist, given that, think about it. I'm saying, given that E works, right? So given that E works, I'm left with a system where E always works. Now I can calculate R2. And given that one E doesn't work, which is 1 minus R1, I'm left with a system where R is faith, where E is faith. You see it? Breaking down my system using conditioning. So if I want to write it, the probability that or the reliability of the system, given that E works, times the probability that E works, plus probability that the system or reliability of the system, given that E fails times the probability that E fades. So good old conditioning, but it saved us a lot of time, right? Because now I can analyze only two cases instead of total enumeration, which was giving us very different um, kind of multiplications or values. So, OK. so. Let's now put, put, the back, put back the numbers in and then calculate the reliability of the system. So we said um, it's going to be, OK, so I, I let you calculate it. So I, you want to give me R1 and R2. And case one was where E failed. And case two was where E worked. works. And then we put it back together. What we should get is the value, the reliability that we got from total enumeration. We can verify that we calculate correctly. What did you get for R1? Should get 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 9, minus 1 minus 5, 2. Calculate it. Mm -hmm. Point nine seven nine. Okay. And what do you get for R two? No way I can hear that. <laughs> it is speak louder for me. Oh, that was internal. Okay. That was I was supposed to hear. Anybody has R two? They're working. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
0.987. Okay, that sounds good. All right, and then we put it back together, right? This is 0 0.979, 0 0.987, and we get the exact same number as total enumeration. You're just doing it slightly smarter. All right, any questions? No questions, it's all clear. Okay, so at this point it becomes a matter of practice and also like trying to like think kind of like creatively about which item or which component to, to condition on. Right? So that so you have to practice, and you're going to see a lot of examples in your quizzes and your in your homework because uh, it may be a little bit tricky which component to pick first. The thing is, okay, if you pick the component, right, you do it works, it doesn't work, and you go through it, you draw the simplified version of the system, right? And if it is still difficult to analyze, don't panic. You can condition further. Right? You don't have to just condition once. You can condition one time, and let's say you didn't pick the easiest, the best, the so called best component to condition on. You can still condition one step further, right? As if that is your new system, you condition. So I, I bet if you condition two tiers, you're going to like solve most problems that you have, you're going to see in class. But if you do it kind of like pick the correct one in the first round, then you sometimes may, you can be easily like doing only one condition. So again, don't don't get discouraged if after looking at works that the work, the system that you're left with is still a little bit complicated. You can either commit and move forward, or you can cho cho choose a different component to condition on. Right? It's up to you which approach you want to take. Uh, so what I do is when I see a system, I try to do it the visualize it in my head. If this component is not there, or and all the path going through it are non-existent, then how easy it is to analyze the system. And if that component collapses to just one simple like connection, then how easy it is to, to analyze that. And as you saw in this case, in this case, sometimes it's not just a matter of visuals, it's just how the relationships are laid out. All right, so again, it comes with practice, but then you should be able to do it quickly like you should be able to like it's a very fat very quick learning curve so okay so i let you practice look at this and first first stare at it right and do it in your head which component are you going to condition on think about it for a couple of minutes then talk to your neighbor and try to convince each other why your answer is better or why your answer is um but why they are, like and listen to them why they think their answer is better. All neighbors agree now. What are you conditioning on? Uh, I cannot see from here. R two. Okay, that's a, that's a good answer. I I'm gonna show you conditioning on R four because to me that's the easiest one. But again, I can also show you the alternative when I'm conditioning on R one. So there are possibilities are endless.
Well, I my I just want to mention on all four. Suppose it doesn't, it's not there, oh. or then it works all the time. You look sharp today. Thank you. Interview? Uh, no, it's for a big presentation. Oh, okay. Good for them. You dress up for them. <laughs> <laughs> Which one are you? What? Well, how's it going? What are you doing? We're, we're looking at this. <laughs> okay. So if our four floors fail, we take it out. Yeah, but when you uh, take our four out, look what the system. So you don't. Have, you don't have any paths from exactly, so that's right. why it becomes so simple. That's why I took that for okay. because at least in one of the cases, I can easily see it. It's super simple. Exactly. Right? Okay. So, then it that's works. Fun. It's a little bit easy, more difficult, but it's manageable. Right. So yeah. think about the path. Okay, so then four, where, where four is that? That's the same. Not, not even a parallel, because see, two of the paths, there's three paths. Two of them go on, yeah. So this is two of Then it works, it's a little bit more interesting. You have to uh, kind of try to think about the path and see what the relationship is. Okay. Are we going? Are we good? Okay. So let's look at it. So then how far is out? Do you agree that the only path that you can find is going to one, two, and eight? Yeah. yeah. The other one is a little bit more exciting. What am I doing?
story is really to learn about yourself and yourself because it has been so fun. So, and like I think people are really going to be able to do that. But the result is just going to keep the same. Love myself that they can be the same. So if, if I take it out, maybe I have two times in my next step. But I take it out, four hours, one hour, and we will do a lot of time. So two of them are going to be the same. More than just to get easy, and then other people are going to get hard. And then two more. Then what are you doing? Then again. Yeah, so that that's I think that is the one that I was doing. So I think that's supposed to be the time. Because if that is true, you have a platform here, a platform here, you don't have a platform here, but you have a platform So it's not that time you see it. All right, as you all saw it, these can get a little bit tricky. So, so let's see. This is the way I did it. So I conditioned on four. So my case one was component. Oops. Let's see. Component for phase. Right. If for phase, it's super simple, right? It takes a it takes out two of the path connecting into out, right? So I'm left with only this system. One, two, three. Agreed? Everybody agrees? Okay, good. So in case one, R1 will be just R1 times R2. The Roman R1 times R3. Okay. So this comes at the expense of now I have a case two that's a little bit more complicated. I have to think about it. But let's see if we can figure it out. So if component four works, again, it's not about how it looks, it's about the path. So you have to be careful. Okay. So I'm making this essentially non extend so I'm erasing this, right? It works all the time. Okay, but now let's think about it. Does it matter if component one fails or works? The system works regardless of component one. So it's as if in my head, I can do a conditioning when component one works, when component one fails, but the reliability is exactly the same. So I'm going to just collapse them. So I'm going to just get rid of case one, uh, component one. Does it make sense? Because it's, it's as if I'm bypassing it all the time. I have, see, I, I have, I'm going through this to that. So it's, I'm, I, I'm bypassing one all the time. So because one, component one is parallel to, to essentially not like a line that, can, like, that bypasses it. So I'm going to just get rid of one. It's non existent. So in essence, my system boils down to a, a parallel system when on one hand I have, I need five to work for the system to work, or I need two and three to work for my system to work.
So you have to say it, 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 it's not as trivial. Again, you could, if, you, if, you were, if you didn't know what to do with one, you could essentially condition on one. Right? You could say if one doesn't work with some priority, I'm going to multiply. Given that one doesn't work, what is my system? Given that one works, what is my system? But you end up with the same reliability. So it's as if you're adding them back together. Make sense? It's again, it takes practice. So don't worry if it's still kind of not settled in yet, but it, you're going to get there. Right? But if it's, if, if at least after I explained what happened, you can follow it then you should be able to do the next one, the next one, the next one. So don't worry about it. Okay, so this will be 1 minus 1 minus R2, R3 times 1 minus R5. Any questions? No, yes, good. Good so far. Okay. So yeah, I also looked at it if you want to practice a little bit more. Uh, you can also look at this other case where you can keep, keep conditioning on all of these components. Like I can have fun with this because you can find essentially the final result and then condition on different components. And you should get this after going through in committing and after going through all of this, you should get the, the same results at the end of the day. So I did this exercise when I conditioned on one. Okay, so if one fails, I said, all right, so this is kind of simple, right? Now for, like, think about it. If I don't have this, every path, I have, I'm left with two paths, right, in to out. Everything goes through four. Right? So in essence, four is in series to a parallel of two, three on the top and five on the bottom. Right? It's not about how it looks, it's about the relationships between them. Do you agree? If one is not there, do you agree that essentially you can eliminate all of this, all of this, right? Because it's it's not in point, it, it doesn't go anywhere, right? And all of this, right? And then now I'm going through this, and then I'm either doing that or that, and then, so essentially four must work, which is the equivalent of series, and then two, three should work, or five should work, right? So if you boil it down into ands and ors, it may help figuring out the structure a little bit better. You agree in this case? Okay, good. All right, so if one fails, essentially you have this four, then you have two, three, or five. So it's all about relationships. Okay, and if one works, then let's see what happens. So essentially, there's a line. Always works. So now think about the path. And again, this becomes tricky because there is this link between these two, right? But in essence, it becomes unimportant. So why? Because you can either work, the system can either work through if two, three work, or the system can work if four, five work, right? That's, that, this is this, right? So, so far. The system can work if two, three work. The system can work if four, five works. And the system would work if four, two, three work. But already I know if two, three works, I don't need four. I don't need that extra one, right? 
So you can essentially simplify your system to either two, three works and the system works, or four, five work and the system works. So I can simplify it that way. If you don't like to do it that way, you, you can further condition on four, and then your system will be super simple, then you can easily analyze it. But I did it actually today, I do it for myself. I did it this way, I conditioned on four, and the, the responses are, or the answers are exactly the same. So again, it's all about thinking about, so again, what is a series? The components in the series, if for the, for the system to work, that it must work, in essence, that series. Parallel, if that one, or this one, or this one, so it can, you have to boil it down to ands and a series of ands and ors, and kind of reconstruct your system. So then this will be that. Okay, are you ready for a complicated one? Okay, so here it is. Okay, my recommendation, think of it as in to out. Lay down the path, right? When things can happen like in parallel to each other, right? When things must work for the system to work. Right? And then figure out what you, are, what you want to condition on. I have done it where I only condition on one. Again, if you don't pick what I picked, you may need to condition twice. But again, don't be scared. It's conditioning. It's nothing. It's as if you're repeating the process twice. You have a system, you condition, you get to another system. Oh, it's still a little bit complex. So you condition another one, and then two step down, you're done. But then if you pick it right, then you can do it only once. My suggestion, write it down in like in uh, vertical and uh, like so let, let open it up first step so let's let's actually think about the path so there's a path from one to three and out then there is one from five seven and out then there is one from two four and out then there is another one from two six eight three and out right i, I i'm I, I don't know if you see the arrows but i have placed arrows here to kind of show you like the dependency between them. No, 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 that's why I have it two different colors. Instead of like doing a bridge, I have them two different colors. Yeah. So no questions about the, the what you are seeing, right? You see the arrows and like the connections. All right, let's, let's condition. Let me know if you have any questions. Take your time. So actually, this is the last exercise before before our guest speaker. Yeah, the other one is the problem is
if it doesn't work, you take it away both times. So you have to, you cannot draw them. So you, you, it's okay to write them this way, but then next step would be move this up, share three between them to make sure you're not missing anything. Yeah. So what are we saying? So, okay. Can I come here? I'm gonna move this here. One, two, right. That's my thing. And say, oh, it is. It has to go both through. <coughs> now look here. For this path, for the in to out, three must work. Okay. And either one should work or two should eight. Right? Okay. So, yeah. it? so you can start by writing them all. That way, yeah. stack them up. But then make sure you the shared component is taken care of. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the next one works. So it's yeah. Typically, then you take it out. It takes half out, so it becomes easier. Oh, so this but actually, that's one way out here. So you were saying that in half and that four work, does that mean that if it's a three path or an three, or do the next one be Because it's two guaranteed work. I think you can it. take it out, but again, it becomes hazy. So I think you're right. But actually, like with the earlier example, I did it both ways and compared. Okay. Because I just wanted to make sure yeah. that I'm not justifying things by for myself. Because with trial, it is very easy that you start justifying things and you're like, oh, I guess it works and it doesn't. So I, I wrote both cases down so it's going to be realistic and I said, exactly, it's going to be exactly the same. But I agree with your statement. It seems like this path is the something done there. It should be able to take that. Because either way, you have to go yeah. through two. And if so it's gone through two and four, you're yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm going to give you this my answer. Then I, I finish it on two. So I'm going to give you mine. And then you can put some numbers in both cases. Okay? And then compare. I like for this. It, it, it may work for like three to seven numbers, four nine and nine. It seems that it's good. Yeah. Um, I can just run for three. Um, I think I got the first part right. So, so in that case, like, you can use it to compare. So you can just have three, you can turn four. Do it numerically, find the, find the final answer, and then compare. Okay. And then let me know. That's, right. some, that's something I do sometimes in the exam. I, have, I used to like, and I was thinking that if I had time, I would solve the problem too late. Yeah. Double check myself against myself, right? And so you exercise. All right, so now that's your question. Um, so if, so if we assume we always work, and the line and mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. um, would this be like the right configuration? Because you so have a one coming out, you have a, a four, or yeah, you have that. I agree. Yeah, it seems to be fine to me. Okay. Okay. But again, let's, let's double check. Okay. Yeah, we'll Okay, I like to because I have the answer. Oh, yeah, I think it's two words. Okay, I, I do pass what they call path analysis, so I have a path of one to three and a five to seven. Uh, yes, they're going parallel. And then I have a four, they got two words. Two words, right? Two words. Right. So I have a four. And then I have a six eight that is in parallel with one. And then both go to three and then out. So you cannot have repeat. No repeat. So two just one one you have a two. Two works. So don't worry about that. And then yeah, so the repeat. The, the repeat, you have to kind of like think about it, right? Because it can either go through 6, 8, and 3, or it can go through 1 and 3, right? So that's the recipe for like 3 in series with the parallel of the other 2. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, okay. You have um, I don't have the final answer. I don't know why I didn't calculate it. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you mine, and then we can we can put numbers in and check. Right. Actually, I asked a couple of people to put numbers in there. It looks like so. We get eight eight seven three. Check. Have you got a number you guys yet? Uh, 
So let me show you how I did it. And again, there are a million ways of doing it. Uh, and they're all correct. But more than, more than the answer here, for me, is the way you analyze it, right? The way you start to think about path and like, this is parallel to that, and this is serious to that. So that's more valuable to me, because I want you to be able to think about these relationships. OK, so I condition on two, but it doesn't mean that it's the only one by any means. So if two fades, what happens? If two fades, it takes out two paths, right? The ones that go through two, which are two, four, and two, six, eight, three, right? So it, they, they both go away. The only thing that's left is one, three. And then five, seven. All right, so that is it. The simple the system simplifies. And then R1, case 1, will be 1 minus 1 minus R1, R3, times 1 minus R5, R7. All right, so that will be the first case. Okay, so back to that. Okay, so if 2 works, it becomes a little bit of an exercise. So let's think about it. If two works, it's as if I have this connection all the time. So let's start with the ones that I already knew. So if two works, I know that, okay, five, seven is going to be there. So into out, that's fine. Then I, if four works, I'm good. My system works. Then uh, let's see. If one, three works, or 683 works, then I'm good. But pay attention, you cannot have a repeat component, right? So I'm, I know that three should work, and then either one works or 63, or sorry, 68. Right. 
So I guess this, was, this will be my system. OK, so I have essentially three blocks that are in parallel with each other. So I have R of 2 will be 1 minus 1 minus R4 times 1 minus R5 times R7 times bless you R3 no oh, uh, let's let's see I can write this as a um, okay. let's see okay so times one minus one minus R minus R1 times 1 minus R6, R7, R8. All right? This is, the, this is the parallel part, 1 and 6, 8. And then that is in series with 3. Or I guess something like this. But you get the idea. This should be right. And finally, we have to, so don't forget the most important part. We broke down the entire system. We conditioned to, put the entire, to find the entire system reliability, right? So you have to multiply case one by when two fails, one minus R2, plus case two where R works times R2. I guess this is it. So if you solve it differently, you want to double check, you can put in numbers in yours and mine, and then just make sure that they match. If they match, you're good. All right, so these can be very interesting exercises. Um, and essentially, you can think of it as a game. Which ones to condition on, and how to do it easier, or how, to, how the relationships are, right? So it's it's a good mental game, I think. All right, so the question. I want at least half of the job done, so I go after something that can, at least in the case where I'm taking it out, it can take out a lot. So at least that's me. But again, I have done that, and then like closer to the end, you see that, oh, there's, the system is too complex. And don't, don't be afraid to condition again. Right? So that's not a big deal. It's as if you already have a smaller system, just condition on it again. You haven't lost anything. Anything else? Okay, so let's take a short break, 10, 15 minutes, and start at 6.30 with our speaker. Thank you. Thank 
Uh, the other thing is we have uh, 40 students or so who are connecting online. Uh, so if you can speak to the mic, then they will be able to hear you as well. And then we are also like record the, the class. Okay. <coughs> uh, do we want to close the ones that are opened or? Let me use yours. I don't know why it's too confusing. Yeah. So I let you. Mike, 
you want, I can hold up your. Fair warning, it falls off all the time, so I end up holding it in my hand. Oh, okay. And it's because I think students who understand may not be able to understand. Okay. Yeah, and that one is okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's get started. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, we have Michelle Foster, who actually is a UP grad. Uh, she graduated from mechanical. Yes, not in Montreal, so I cannot claim her. Uh, from mechanical engineering, and she's a related and major engineer, and she works on all systems. All systems. So where's the? Uh... Oh, okay. Uh, there, uh, she said, my name is Michelle Foster. I am a, uh, what they call a maintenance and reliability engineer at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, how I'm going to start this presentation is I'll just want to talk about how I became an engineer, where I went to school, and so, as she said, the orange is a hint. Uh, what I do as an engineer at uh, ORNL, uh, Hyper, I explain what Hyper is in, uh, in here in a few minutes and also the uh, future of maintenance technology. My background is I have 27 years as a condition monitor and what they call a predictive maintenance engineer. Uh, I graduated from Fulton High School here in Knoxville and the University of Tennessee, as I just mentioned. And the other thing is I'm a mother of one. And a little bit of background of that story is that I did give birth to my daughter when I was in high school. Uh, I was also part of a STEM program, and uh, the one thing that I just wanted to mention, two big things that, that happened in my life was my daughter and my career in engineering. Uh, as far as college went, uh, as we just mentioned, I attended here at the University of Tennessee. One of my other claims to fame is that I was in the pride of the Southland Band back when I was in school, and believe it or not, 27-something odd years later, <laughs> I still know my uh, part the Rocky Top. In fact, I played it last week at homecoming. Uh, I did earn a degree in uh, bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Another thing that I did while I was in college was I participated in what they call the methanol challenge. And what the methanol challenge was is that we had a, you know, the state of the art 1988 Chevrolet Corsica, which they don't even make those anymore. <laughs> And uh, we converted this vehicle uh, to run off of methanol fuel. Now, methanol fuel is not really as known now as it was back then. I think the fuel now is ethanol, where they do ethanol blends with uh, gasoline. But back then, they were researching ethanol and methanol. And I think they came to the conclusion that ethanol is easier to make because ethanol is corn-based, whereas methanol is wood-based. So I think that's one of the reasons why they went with methanol versus uh, ethanol. I mean, ethanol versus methanol, excuse me. A uh, little bit about my career. In 1991, all those years ago, <laughs> I started at the Y-12 plant. Uh, uh, 2002, I went to Houston, Texas and worked at that, uh, at, at a chemical plant outside of Houston uh, for a few years and I came back to Y-12, and when I came back to Y-12, they changed their name to the Y-12 National Security Complex, 2005. And then in uh, 2013, I uh, accepted the job over at the lab at the high uh, flux isotope reactor in Hyper for short. Um, just a quick word about some of the uh, lab's missions. Um, we have four major missions. Neutrons, computing, I'm not going to read this whole slide, materials, and nuclear. And I'm in the neutrons part. The uh, high flux isotope reactor uh, is one of the neutron sources at the lab that the researchers come and 
I, as, and as I say, play with the new car. Um, this slide, again, is really, really busy. A couple of things I wanted to point out was that um, there's about uh, 4,500 scientists and engineers and support people that work at the lab. And the other thing I want to point out on the other side of the slide is that 62% of our work is in the energy sector. There's also the, uh, I mean, the science sector, excuse me. It's also the energy sector and also the national security, but the biggest uh, portion of our work is in the sciences. Um, now, moving on to the technologies that we use in maintenance at Hyper is that um, we have vibration analysis, fluid analysis, infrared thermography, uh, ultrasonic analysis, motor current analysis. We also, uh, the other technologies that that go along with that is laser alignment, precision balancing, and motion amplification. Um, the way I like to uh, uh, relate this is that in medicine, there's certain tests that uh, are certain measurements that we take on human beings, and then I equate that to the measurements that we uh, take on uh, machines. Like for a blood test, we do uh, fluid analysis for temperature. We can either, you know, measure the temperature or use the infrared imager. Ultrasound is uh, similar to, well, actually, yeah, ultrasound is similar to the ultras ultrasonic analysis that we use. Like a, and <clears throat> excuse me, we measure the heartbeat, where you can use vibration analysis or motor current analysis. And for vibration analysis. Vibration is basically simply an oscillation of a body around a reference point. You have your body, you have oscillation in, rela in relationship to it. The vibration analysis is a technique that monitors the condition of rotating equipment by focusing on the vibration that a, a piece of equipment transmits. And uh, for very little investment, you can predict of uh, millions of dollars of assets and equipment. Uh, vibration analysis is used to monitor almost anything that rotates from fans, pumps, motors, compressors, chillers, uh, mixers, it's a bunch of stuff. And also, um, what vibration analysis can detect is bearing problems, belt problems, shaft problems, misalignment, oil whirl, resonance, cavitation, and recirculation. Uh, Gear problems and a bunch more that I won't read. And why that's important is because if you can figure out what's going on with your machine, then you can fix them in the timely manner that you control versus your machines breaking down and everybody running around trying to figure out, you know, the how to fix this machine and and then you know you're losing product and losing assets um, in the meanwhile. With this, this slide right here is just showing it's, it's what is called a vibration signature. And what I like to illustrate here is that I have the blue uh, signature is actually a machine with the fault. It's a machine that was out at the uh, uh, site where I work. Then after we fixed it, I went back and took another reading, and it's the red reading. As you see, basically you can see there's something there, then it's something there. It's not there after we fixed it. The fluid analysis, fluid analysis is basically, you know, the, uh, the elemental makeup of a fluid, especially what I'm focusing on is the amount of degradation and contamination in the fluid. I have a little slide uh, here. This is actually some, micro, uh, on the microscopic scale, uh, particles that's in uh, a fluid. And the thing about uh, all the people don't really think about, but Industry is traveling on like a 10 micron film of oil, which is like the fourth of a width of a human hair. And if you don't have good fluid performance, you don't have good machine performance. And if you have poor machine performance, then your reliability of your facility is compromised. What we do at Hyper, which I didn't ever explain what Hyper was, is called, Hyper is called the high flux isotope reactor. 
And our claim to fame is that we have the highest neutron flux in the world. And what that's, why that's important is that um, what we basically do is we're a small nuclear reactor. And when the uh, uranium fuel burns, the neutrons that burn off of that nuclear reaction, they go down tubes and uh, uh, there's four of them. And that, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the researchers on the other end of the uh, tubes, they take the neutrons and they uh, uh, shoot them through materials and they study materials, they study biological materials, non-biological materials, and, and they do all sorts of things that I really don't know, but, uh, but they love their neutrons. So um, we also, one of all the claims of fame at the Hyper is that we have cold neutrons and thermal neutrons. And our cold neutrons are in an environment of 15 degrees Kelvin. And that's uh, a lot of the uh, uh, researchers like the slow moving cold neutrons. But getting back to the fluid analysis, we have about six or seven areas that we uh, uh, analyze our fluid on. Our many our primary and secondary cooling pumps, which is kind of the life's blood of our uh, systems because we don't keep our reactor cool. A whole lot of ugly things happen that nobody wants to talk about. We also, uh, our cooling tower gearboxes, air compressors, our chiller, our helium compressors, which our helium compressors are instrumental in that 15 degrees Kevin I just mentioned, and then our diesels and our rod drive shim gearbox. But ultrasound, ultrasound is kind of interesting because I have three bands up here. One, I talk about vibration. Then I have a demodulated vibration, which that's why I'm nerdy vibration people. And then ultrasound kind of goes out beyond that. And why that's important is because uh, ultrasound focuses on, on uh, the high frequency the component makes. And ultrasound detector, what it does is it does this thing called hydrodyning. And with hydrodyning, it takes that high frequency that you can't hear, it's kind of like in the dog range, <laughs> and it brings it down to a uh, uh, sound that you that we can audibly hear as humans. And what we're what we're finding out more and more is that a lot of uh, friction and uh, what am I trying to, what am I trying to say? Like frictionary forces. If you have low lubrication, it it uh, makes a lot of sound in the high frequency level. And so, uh, if you can uh, get out and get those components lubricated, then it's kind of like back what I just said about the fluid. You can keep your systems running a lot better. There's a lot of uh, uh, things that you can measure with ultrasound. It's one of our early, uh, it's one of our newest technologies that we're growing at the Hyper. The two biggest things that we do is acoustic lubrication and uh, steam traps. And I have a sound file here that I'm not sure if it's going to work or not, but. We'll try it one more time. You see, this is reaction, and as we put grease into the burn, see how the sound diminished. And what this, uh, how this is helpful is, believe it or not, there's a lot of uh, issues with over greasing burns and under greasing burns. And when you use ultrasound technology, you put the right amount of grease in. And I mean, the machine tells you when it's hot. So. Uh, that presents a lot of problems in the future. Uh, there we go. My next topic is uh, uh, infrared. And basically, infrared is transfer of heat by wavelength that is a little bit longer than visible light in the electromagnetic energy spectrum. Uh, infrared analysis is the imaging technique that focuses on the infrared radiation an object produces. The infrared detector is the device that measures infrared radiation. 
and then temperature can be determined based on that measured radiation. And uh, the uh, infrared imager converts the infrared radiation to a visible light spectrum to convert something you can't see to something you can see and that produces a visible image. Now, I call this my WTF slide. And it kind of, uh, which is what's the frequency in my case, kind of shows you all in the uh, uh, electromagnetic frequency band where all the uh, technologies kind of lie. You see the blue is your uh, vibration. The uh, ultrasound is the orange and yellow band. Then you got your infrared. And then there's like motor testing. Motor testing is fo uh, focuses on 60 hertz, which is what we call our line frequency here in the United States. If you was in Europe, it would be 50 hertz, but here in the United States, it's 60 hertz. And then there's also one more that I don't have on the slide, and it's the uh, ultraviolet uh, radiation. There is also a, a device that measures ultraviolet radi radiation. We don't use it at HIFR, but it's mainly used for high voltage power lines. If you can, if the, uh, it's called, the uh, phenomenon is called corona. If the, uh, the corona puts out these ultraviolet uh, wavelengths, believe it or not. <laughs> And uh, uh, that the ultraviolet camera can pick up on that. If you, if you start seeing that in your uh, uh, data, then you know you need to probably give those power lines some attention. Uh, some of the applications of infrared thermography is uh, military and law enforcement, uh, remote sensing of ecological systems, product testing, county structure testing, medical. And what I do is predict the maintenance and condition monitoring. And what we do at HIFR is uh, we do roof, excuse me, roof surveys, uh, rotating equipment inspections, electrical equipment inspections, and steam traps. This little picture right here, it's a, believe it or not, it's a, uh, uh, I got this picture off the internet 25 years ago. And this is supposed to be a suspected uh, marijuana growing operation, which in some states that's legal now, but uh, back then it wasn't. And so you have to say, well, one thing you have to say that it's suspected. Another thing is um, there's certain uh, caveats that you have to uh, uh, keep in mind when you see a picture like this. One thing, if it's, you know, a summer day in East Tennessee, you're not going to see that much of a temperature difference. Uh, in your in your house, it has to be a day like today, 50s, maybe in the 60s or below. And also, uh, there might be some other reasons why that bottom part of the house is warm. The first thing I want to talk about is roof surveys. Roof surveys are interesting because what happens is during the day, your dry insulation and your wet insulation warms up at the same rate and it has to be a sunny day. Uh, day like today was really cloudy, wouldn't work. Then at night, what happens is your wet insulation dries slower than your dry insulation. And the interesting thing, uh, interesting phenomena that happens is that you start, you see these rectangular shapes uh, when you do your survey. As you see that I Put the time up here. One, this one's taken at 9:30 in the evening. One above, I think it's like 9:45. And the thing that you notice is these rectangular shapes. If it was something else, you wouldn't see the straight lines. But straight lines is an indicator that you probably have a bad, uh, have some wet roof and going to get some leaks pretty soon. Next thing I want to talk about is the electrical inspections. There's a lot of things uh, that you can pick up on in the infrared inspection of the electrical equipment. This is a um, electrical panel, basically a lighting panel. You see we have a red spot right here. You see in the after, there's not, you don't see that red spot in the same temperature scale. And what the deal was here was it was actually a loose connection. And once the uh, uh, guys came in and cleaned it up and tightened it up, the uh, temperature went away. Now up here at the top, 
This is what we uh, what we call a pony motor battery bank. And what the pony motor is, we have these big motors that run our primary cooling system. In case of a power outage, we have to have a uh, subsequent power source. And so what they decided to do was run these motors off of batteries. These aren't just little bitty batteries. This is a huge battery bank. And so what we found out is that uh, we can do an infrared image on the battery bank and tell whether or not the fluid in the batteries, they're similar to car batteries, but not quite where you have the fluid. And so uh, we can tell where our fluid levels are and if it's at a good level or not a good level. Next thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, rotating equipment inspection and also steam trap inspection. An interesting thing about this was uh, the, our uh, pump at the top where you see it says 214, 105. An uh, interesting thing was happening with this pump. Uh, it would warm up and then cool down. Well, this one, this time it warmed up and it never, it didn't cool down, so it was a problem. So we changed out the, bar, bar, the bearing in it, and then it went down to 105 degrees. And the thing about what the problem is with uh, a bearing running at hot, 214 degrees Fahrenheit, is that every, I think for every 18 degrees above 150 degrees, you, uh, your lubricant breaks down twice as fast. So what happens if you've got something running too hot, you wind up, you can wind up, and if you don't fix it, you'll wind up uh, having a failure, a bearing failure in your system. So you don't want that to happen. Also, this, uh, uh, this one at the bottom, to a water pump, this was a routine reading right here. Then uh, I had an operator come and tell me that, or tell us that uh, the uh, pump felt warm. When come to find out it was, it was 40 degrees warmer than it was when uh, I took my routine reading. Then we uh, fixed the pump, then it went back down to almost the same temperature that, uh, not the pump, actually this is the motor, I'm sorry. It went down almost the same temperature as the original. This picture right here is, uh, is two steam traps. And they got one. This has you see the steam going through the trap. Have one that the steam is not going through the trap. And actually, this is the way that it was supposed to operate. So it had one operating and one not operating. And I just find this an interesting picture to show. That you can actually see, you know, the function of the steam or part of the function of the steam trap based on infrared image. With motor testing, there's two kinds of tests with motor testing. You have your online test and your offline test. The offline test, you have your winding resistance check, your installation resistance, your polar polarization index, and your surge test. With the online test, they check for loose motor foundations, belt defects, degrade, degrade and top degradation or breakdown the circuitry, the um, current imbalance and loading problems, the rotor eccentricity, the rotor damage, and also power quality disturbances. So laser alignment, laser alignment is interesting because it uses lasers. And believe it or not, um, one of the uh, worst, one of the things that can impact your reliability is your collinearity of your shafts. Uh, what you want to do for precision uh, for precision maintenance is have your shafts within five mils of each other. Uh, with the laser, you have a you have a uh, your laser and your receiver. You uh, the receiver tracks the movement of the laser as you rotate it around. You can rotate the shaft around. You can then you uh, align your shafts like I said within five mils. And this system can also do what they call a live mode. You set up your laser, set up your uh, receiver, 
as it is down here. And when you turn on the machine, you can, uh, you can actually see the difference in movement from cold to warm. And what that does is when you do uh, cold to warm uh, live, what they call live mode of monitoring, then you can go back and intentionally misalign your shafts so they will be collinear when um, you're running them. And the reason why you want your shafts collinear is because when you have a misaligned shaft, it wreaks havoc on your bearings. And so you don't, don't want your bearings messing up all the time, so you uh, keep your machines aligned if you can. And this next one is motion amplification. With the uh, motion amplification, what happens is, is that what uh, this video does, and this is one of our new, the newest technologies out in the quote unquote maintenance world. And what it does is basically the video amplifies every pixel in the uh, frame. I don't think my video is going to work. But it uh, amplifies the motion of all the videos in the frame, or all the pixels in the frame. And uh, what it shows you is how much, um, I'll say how much a machine is moving, but it's like on a microscopic scale. Oh, well. Um, when we get to the benefits of uh, condition monitoring, we can monitor the machines while it's running so we don't have to have, in most cases, we don't have to have an outage or an interruption of operations to do our measurement. We service it only when it's needed. We also have more effective planning and scheduling. We, don't, we uh, schedule our maintenance to our needs versus the machines telling us when we need to work on them. Uh, that's probably not the most accurate statements because machines tell you when to work on them, but you can control when you want to work on them. Also, we increase our equipment reliability, uh, minimize catastrophic failures, and reduce maintenance costs. And as I said just a minute ago, I'm going down to the bottom, we provide exclusive control of machines that show the beginning of a malfunction. Um, this is the Peter F curve. Has anybody seen this before, PDF curve? Um, one thing that I like to talk about when I uh, talk about the PDF curve is just talk about how it's the further you are toward the blue, the better you are in controlling how your plant operates and how you can control your maintenance uh, with some of the uh, your maintenance activities in, in your plant. Another thing I want to go to. Um, this is kind of, uh, just a real quick uh, illustration of the uh, uh, con uh, condition-based monitoring cycle. We collect, analyze, report, take action, do a post-work measurement, and then start the process all over again. Uh, these are this is a slide that I started out with 25 years ago, and it was kind of where we were going, but actually we're here now. You know, back in the day, as people like to say, it was breakdown maintenance. You broke it. I mean, if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. Then you went to skilled craft people to where craft people would go around to their machines and they go, this one doesn't sound right. Maybe we need to check it out. Then we went to a periodic or time-based maintenance. Then with condition-based maintenance, which is uh, what I primarily do, and then now we're at the point where we're at remote diagnostics. There's even some AI things out there, Internet of Things and a bunch of stuff like that. But we actually have three systems at my facility that we actually do remote diagnostics on. And we're in the process of, of, uh, of wiring up a fourth and a fifth system. So I so said we're 
This used to be the wave of the future, but actually we, we're here now. And that's all I have for that one. Does anybody have any questions? Um, as far as uh, the future in eight now, I'd, at my plant, we don't have any. AI stuff just yet, but what we do have is the remote diagnostics to where I'm, I have sensors wired up on um, machines out in the plant. In fact, there's one um, system, the, my, our primary cooling pumps, which is like I said, that's the, our main system in the plant. When we're up and running, uh, the radiation is so high, nobody, uh, humans can't go in this area. So. The only way that can it can be monitored is remotely. So, uh, uh, like I said, I don't have we don't have AI at a, at our facility just yet. But there's a lot of like cloud-based systems where the information is fed up to the cloud. E it either it either is being analyzed by people or sometimes they have these uh, programs that analyze the data and feed them back. But that's a bit not a not in my facility. The one thing I wanted to talk about, since this is a reliability class, how some of the uh, um, a couple of the case histories that I've had to. Uh, Some of the case histories that I've dealt with that has impacted reliability. This is, it's called a hog fan four, which hog stands for hot off gas. They have a lot of exhaust and it goes through what they call this hog system and then goes out a bit stacked. So these fans are really important to get this air moved out of the facility. Um, we did a PM on this particular fan and we were in, uh, uh, also we replaced the motor on this fan. When we were doing our post maintenance test, which you saw my circle, which is part of the cycle, uh, the 24 hour run, uh, operations noticed that the, the burns were looking warm. We went out with our uh, thermal camera, took some, uh, uh, temp uh, took some temperatures. Then uh, based on where these temperatures were, we knew something strange was going on because they were warm, but they were warm toward the shaft on the inside of the burn. The normal, the way the burns normally look is like in this picture where the hot spot is in the middle of the burn. It's about 150 degrees, which is about where we, we like these particular burns to be. But the other picture you see is uh, 220, 225 degrees. And it was very close to the shaft. So we knew something wasn't right. And what we figured out amongst the, uh, this, when I went back and said, guys, this is warm and it's warm right at the shaft, the uh, mill right saw so I noticed that we probably need to adjust the packing. And they adjust the packing and it went back to this. And how this uh, impacts reliability is, like I said a few, uh, few slides back is, when you have warmer temperatures on your burns, you break down your lube. And even though this particular oil could take uh, higher temperatures, I think the flash point of this oil was like 250. We still like to be in that sweet spot since we knew that these burns ran about 140 degrees. We really didn't want them running 60 degrees or 80 degrees higher than what they normally run. <coughs> Excuse me. And this next one I got here. The case study on a pump. 
that you saw it in my original, um, uh, on my first presentation, this pump, uh, like I said, when I was showing my infrared stuff was, uh, this pump, it had a, a history of being, when we first started it up, it would warm up and cool down. But this time it didn't cool down. Um, we, uh, uh, what they would do is they would put a fan on the bearing and that would help it. But we, could, we found out that, yeah, we was causing damage to this bearing and we finally needed to replace it. Let's see here. I mean, because this was a few years ago, so I'm, I'm, I'm remembering, trying to remember what, what all we did. Oh, okay. What we did was uh, we went ahead and and changed out the bearing and, and aligned it. But we, went, we really didn't get much improvement in our temperature. I think we went from 200 and, 214 to like 189, which is not, as, not the improvement that we wanted to see. So we also decided that uh, we did that little live mode thing that y'all just showed just a minute ago to see how this machine was moving once we were, it was up and running and warming up. What we found out was if this machine was moving like 20 mils out once it warmed up. Now, what you like to see, like I said, is five and under. 25 is way out, especially if you want precision maintenance. So what we did was, after we took that first measurement, like I said in the, uh, in the other slide, in the other presentation, we went and we misaligned the machine so that when we measured it, it would be closer in alignment. We had a little bit of improvement on the uh, uh, next one. Then when we did this next measurement, we went from 25 to almost 10. Then from, from uh, the original measurement, I'll go ahead and go to the, okay. We had one more step to do in here. We did this original measurement. It got a little bit better. We got from uh, 187 to 137. Then it's inboard burning. It's still a little warm. And what we found out, there's a phenomenon called soft foot. In our case, it was really bad because we had grout missing under the feet. And what was happening was, what happens with soft foot is that your base is, it's either your, the foot of your uh, pump is flexing, or in our case, our base was flexing because we had grout missing under our base. So what we wound up doing was, we wound up putting a plate under this foot, um, and that took out the soft foot and also got our temperatures from 200 or 214 to 133. And so we're hoping that from a liability standpoint, and this was done back in uh, 2015, and we haven't had a problem with this particular pump in the last three years. So hoping that fixed it. And I think I have one more case study. This particular machine, it was another one of our hog fans. And what happened was there was a, uh, uh, a uh, operations noted a, noticed a cyclic sound. And the technical term is wong, wong, wong. That's, that's what the machine was doing. So uh, uh, they went to the system engineer who contacted me, and we went out and we took a bunch of data. We also got uh, opportunity to use this motion amplification uh, technology. What I found out in my analysis is that the motor was experiencing the phenomena called beating, and that's why you could hear that noise. Uh, there's also some other analysis that I found that, that we call what uh, resonance was going on. 
and the motion amplification confirmed the phase readings. Now, um, beating, the best way I can describe it is, uh, it's like if you see two cars with their blinkers on, you know, so that the blinkers, they would blink at the same time, then they will go out of sync with the blinking and they, and that's kind of what happens between two machines. Most of the times it's not a problem. It's not a problem to the presents a problem, if that makes any sense. This is, a, I was describing uh, what I do to take with phase readings, and this is kind of an advanced uh, vibration um, uh, study. But what, uh, what I found out was all your green readings are in phase. All your red readings are in resonance. We, about half and half. You really don't want to see anything in resonance. And so, so if you see all of this red, that's, that's not a good thing. The reason why resonance is a problem is that, uh, I might explain that here in a minute. Let's see if I can uh, get this video. Okay. Uh, the reason why resonance is a problem is because it amplifies uh, your vibration. And if your vibration it gets amplified, it winds up tearing up your machine. That's why it's a problem for um, um, reliability. And so what we did was, believe it or not, uh, we talked to one of the uh, uh, millwrights, well, actually, he's a millwright supervisor who had like 40 years experience with the plant. And he asked the question, did y'all put the wedges back when you fixed that fan? And so everybody's looking around like, wedges? What wedges? So there was wooden wedges uh, that went in between this uh, fan base right here, over this fan, and the motor base. And so that was keeping the uh, vibration down in it. And so what happened was, and my video's not working, is that uh, in this last video, the, this motor is barely moved versus the first uh, uh, video where it was really shaking and bouncing around. And so that's just a few examples of how maintenance technology helps reliability. Does anybody have any questions? Everybody ready to go home? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you all letting me come and speak. So. <laughs> Well, I'll say learn as much as you can about technology. Actually, how I got in the field 27 years ago is that when I hired in at, at Y12, my uh, manager came up and said, you're going to learn about vibration analysis. And I said, I am. <laughs> and, 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 and I haven't regretted uh, learning about it. But if you can just learn as much as you can about the technologies that are out there, like I said, we just got a new technology with this motion amplification. Uh, the one thing, uh, reliability is what's surprising to me being in the field for over 25 years is that reliability is becoming and, and has become a more and more serious topic with a lot of companies. They, companies finally got to the point and understood stood and understand that if you keep your machines running, and keep them maintained, I guess is the word I should use, keep your machines maintained, then your machines will make you the profits that you're looking for. Now, in our case, we don't, we don't really make money at the high flux high to reactor, but what we have to do uh, is keep our reactor running when it's supposed to run. 
right now we're running at a 99.4 reliability rate and availability rate. Um, we, I think out of our hours, I think we had like five or six hours that we didn't run. Um, so in our case, if we don't keep our reliability up, we don't have the researchers coming to do their work. So that's why reliability is important to us. And reliability is important to a lot of these profit making companies because if you have machines that are down, your their product is not going out the door. But there, like I said, a lot of people have finally gotten the point that if you, the, the more you invest in reliability, the more money you're gonna make on the backside of it. So this, you know, learn as much as you can. Uh, that's, I think, what has kept me in the business for so long is just the ability to be open and learn things. I'm, in fact, I'm taking a series of classes here at uh, UT, uh, learning more about reliability. So, and I said, I've been in the business 25 years. One of the things that, uh, you know, in the reliability arena is they talk about the criticality analysis, which is which machines are the most critical uh, in your facility. As I had mentioned several different times, we have a system called our primary cooling. That's our biggest, most important system in our facility. So uh, when you do, if for, for unknowns, if you do the criticality analysis, we kind of know, knew, I said our organization knows because we've been running that, they've been running that plant for 50 years. So uh, based on it, their experience, they knew exactly when, and they have done what they call a, a technical safety um, analysis. So based on their technical safety analysis, they knew what machine need to, uh, what system, excuse me, need to function properly to uh, keep that reactor doing what it's supposed to do. And like I said, a lot of these other companies out there that, you know, at this point, if they haven't already started, they know they need to do, they have the criticality analysis to tell them what systems are important in their plant. And then based on, uh, you pick the technology based on what they call the failure modes. And you guys, are y'all familiar with failure modes and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, you pick the technology based on your failure modes. If you're interested in bearings, then you know, it's probably gonna be ultrasound and vibration and uh, infrared. If you're electrical components, it's probably gonna be ultrasound and uh, infrared. And, and it goes from there. 